scientist, philosopher, feminist, author, environmentalist, activist, Dr. Vandana Shiva is a one-woman movement for peace, sustainability, and social justice. In the 1970s, she was one of the original tree huggers, the Chipko group of Indian women who surrounded trees to prevent them from being felled. Since then, she has become a passionate opponent of globalization and the irresponsible use of biotechnology and genetic engineering, especially in agriculture, and an equally passionate advocate for bioethics, ecofeminism, and biodiversity. Dr. Shiva is the founder of the Research Foundation for Science, Technology, and Ecology, and of the organic farming program Navdanya. She is the author of nearly 20 books on such subjects as biopiracy, ecofeminism, and earth democracy. Among her many honors is the Right Livelihood Award, also known as the Alternative Nobel Prize, for her work in placing women and ecology at the center of the international development agenda. I spoke with Vandana Shiva in Thimphu, Bhutan, in December 2009. Dr. Shiva, thank you so much for doing this. It's my pleasure. It's a great pleasure to meet you. <laughs> I, uh, you've done so much and in so many different fields, and uh, I think we could probably, s I could certainly spend many hours uh, talking with you about a uh, number of those things, but I wanted to focus on the, uh, on the environmental aspect of, of your work. And uh, I was struck by one of your quotations which said, you are not Atlas carrying the world on your shoulder, it is good to remember that the planet is carrying you. And I thought that would be a very good text for this conversation. Well, you know, I've felt very often we underestimate the power of nature yes. and we overestimate our contribution even when you're trying to save the planet. We burden ourselves, we suffer under the burden and that image of Atlas carrying the world in the, uh, is, is in a way a very real psychological experience for many activists. I think that's very true and, and uh, yeah, it's nice to be reminded of the fact that probably we're not as important as we think we are. Exactly. I think we've got to do the right thing, not because we are important, but because the only way to live yes. is yes. to do the right thing. Not because it's a grand thing, not because Gaia is waiting for your little bit. She can get along very well without us. <laughs> and has. I wanted to ask you about, bio, to, to, to talk a bit, if you would, about biopiracy and the whole relationship of intellectual property to the environmental problem, because I think you probably opened that subject up and it's a fascinating and, and really fundamental one. Um, I have called biopiracy the second coming of Columbus. Uh, 500 years ago, a little over, Columbus went equipped with what was called a letters patent because the other letters were closed and sealed. They were about conspiracies. This was about the de declaration of taking over other people's territories as long as they were not ruled by white Christian princes, which meant the rest of the world outside Europe. And the power to Columbus was given by the queen and king of Spain, and the power to the king and queen of Spain was given by the pope, and the pope claimed the power to give all these powers was given by God directly. And that is why it was called the Papal Bull in 1492 that said, go conquer the territories of the rest of the world. And that has continued till to today. At that time, what was being colonized was territories. Now, in my view, what's being attempted to be colonized is life itself. The potential of life, the species on this planet, to support human life and everything we need from the clothes we wear to the foods we eat to the buildings we build with wood everything is provided ultimately by nature and where it's renewable ultimately by biodiversity so at a time where the fossil fuel age is winding down and every signal is there we have peak oil we have the climate catastrophe those who gave us the climate disaster, those who colonized the world through oil, also know that the conquest over green oil is their next conquest. And for this, the problem is oil is non-renewable and it exists in certain places. Life is renewable and is all over. So how do you turn this into your grand monopoly 
to cr create wealth for a few. Patenting becomes the means by which you can forbid others from making or using or distributing or developing what is patented. It so happens that the industrialized West has spent two centuries in an oil civilization. And it spent a century in a chemical civilization. It forgot about biodiversity. Today that biodiversity is becoming such an important part of life as well as the economy, to control that biodiversity, you have to turn to the cultures that have protected it. And then you have to steal what they have, both the biological wealth as well as the intellectual cultural traditions that are embodied in that biological wealth, which plants are healing plants, which seeds give it what kind of food. And so the phenomena of biopiracy started. And I have had to challenge it intellectually. I've had to challenge it legally. We have fought cases against the neem patenting, this wonderful tree that gives us a natural pest control agent. And I started this when the Bhopal disaster happened because the pesticide leak from the Union Carbide plant killed, has killed 30,000 people now. And we didn't need it because the neem gave us totally safe pest control. Uh, the basmati that my, my valley is very famous for and the basmati is all over the world as this aromatic rice is patented by a Texas company that claimed to have invented the seed, the plant, the methods of cooking, even the aroma in the rice. And then Monsanto, which is my very favorite company in the world, uh, patented an old Indian wheat variety because it has very low gluten, because industrial wheat breeding has generated gluten allergies around the world. Our new campaign is the piracy of all the climate resilient crops in the world through patenting. Crops that can tolerate a severe drought, crops that can deal with flooding, crops that can tolerate the salt as cyclones bring salt water from the sea. I call this the biopiracy of climate resilience. Um, the industry is not stopping, they carry on and on. Uh, we too will carry on and on celebrating life, defending it in the commons, because my response to biopiracy is keep knowledge and biodiversity in the commons, spread it to future generations, and let its utilization be the defense against monopoly. It's actually hard to believe, isn't it, that, that, that anybody would have the gall to say that they had invented something like basmati rice. That it takes gall. It takes a lot of gall. And, and I think that must surely be the way that they get away with some of this stuff, is that nobody can quite believe that they are seriously trying to do that. And then the next thing you know, they've, had a, you know, they've, they've got a patent and, uh, and the issue is now a yeah. serious legal one. I think they'd have got away with most of these patents. But I was very fortunate that 22 years ago, I was invited to a meeting in Geneva called the Laws of Life. It was on the new biotechnologies and scientists like me were there, the industry was there, United Nations people were there. And the industry laid out its agenda for the future. And the agenda was, we will be five companies controlling food and health. And the means of control will be acquiring other companies, becoming big giants, genetic engineering, and patenting. When I heard that, I said, I've got to figure out what's going on. And they also said that, at that point, the GATT, the General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs, which later became the WTO, would be the instrument of conquest. So I monitored every paragraph of what was going on in this treaty. I learned and taught myself intellectual property rights issues and kept my eyes and ears open. So when a biotechnology journal said the world's first use of neem, I thought of my grandmother and I said, oh my God, they're stealing our grandmother's knowledge now. Um, same with the Basmati, and I think it, it took citizen vigilance to even track this. Otherwise, they'd have got away with this. And before we knew it, we would be paying royalties for everything of daily use. And these royalties have very high costs. In India, the introduction of genetically engineered cotton seed, BT cotton, which has a royalty connected to it, and the price shot up from 7 rupees to 1,700 rupees. It has led to such high levels of indebtedness for farmers that 200,000 Indian farmers have committed suicide in 10 years alone. Now, this is just the beginning of these monopolies. If we don't stop it, 
it's going to be ecocide and genocide on a scale we have not known because what they're appropriating is the very basis of the provisioning of life, the very basis through which life provides life. Basically, um, seizing the right to grow food. And, Absolutely. And, and licensing it to the rest. Yeah, of seizing the right to grow food, but I think it's deeper because I've had this conversation with these corporations now, tw two decades and more, and I'm two conversations stick in my head. The first is, you know, when the hybrid seed that Cargill, which today is the world's biggest grain trading company, but its seed wing has been now bought up by Monsanto, which is the world's biggest seed company. Well, 92 Cargill seeds failed in India. They were hybrid sunflower seeds. And the farmers had a huge action, tore down the seed plant. And, yeah, or maybe, maybe and the Cargill a chief had a press conference and said, these Indian peasants yeah. are so stupid, they don't realize we have brought them a technology that is so smart, it can prevent the bees from usurping the pollen. Now, for these companies, it's not just preventing the farmer from having the right to seed. For them, the pollinators that give us food are thieves. And then a little later, the Convention on Biological Diversity Negotiations, where Monsanto wanted the right to spread genetically engineered crops, including herbicide-resistant, Roundup-resistant soya and corn, without any regulation and approval, their justification was that these Roundup-resistant crops prevent the weeds from stealing the sunshine, as if even the sun must shine with their permission. So it is a cos cosmological perversion, you know? It's so psychologically deep. I think they should all be sent to Bhutan to understand how to live at peace with nature. I, I think we're too fond of Bhutan to send them here, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't consider it. Or maybe, maybe have a little extension in, in New York City or something. <laughs> yeah, Antarctica. How would that be? <laughs> it's, uh, we've had cases in Canada too, of course, where, where uh, genetically engineered seed has spread spontaneously from one farmer's farm to another, and then Monsanto has gone after the farmer for growing proprietary crops. Yeah. You know? And, um, you know, I intervened in that case of Percy mm -hmm. Smyser. Yes. We have a tiny little foundation in India which I started from my mother's cow shed. <laughs> but when it's needed, we will go anywhere. And um, we intervened. And fortunately, as a result of a global intervention, the Supreme Court did not allow Monsanto to fine him. But they said, as long as patenting exists, as long as patents on life are allowed, then the uh, occurrence of what is patented without the patent owner's permission is theft. So even if the wind took the pollen, even if pollination crossed the canola crop, it is considered as theft. And Percy and I have done lots of things together um, across the world um, for the freedom of the seed, the freedom of life, and the freedom of the farmers, because we feel this is such a vital issue. Well, it is, and it's very far from over, isn't it? I mean, there have been some significant battles and some, some, uh, some very memorable victories, but the war is still on, isn't it? Uh, the war is still on. Uh, I think if you, if you map, it's something we haven't done, but if you were to map the promise of the industry and its failures, the failures outdo their successes. Their first um, gen um, genetically engineered product, the recombinant bovine growth hormone, by which they give injections to cows to turn more of the food into producing milk and less into maintaining the body of the cow so that the cow becomes a skeleton and in seven years its life is over. But in those seven years it's produced 5% more milk. Canada had to ban it because the data showed that this is creating new diseases in the, for the cow and in the milk and through that for the humans. I remember a very highly acclaimed product was something called a flavor saver tomato. And it was supposed to never rot. They had removed the gene that allowed the skin to crinkle. It was, I call it the botoxing of the tomato. <laughs> Just like all women don't like to recognize they have age catching up and don't recognize that wrinkles are such a beautiful expression of experience. Um, they 
they made this non-rotting tomato, which is rotten inside. It was cosmetically not rotting. It was hard like a ball. You throw it across against the wall and it comes back. Again, you know, it comes back like a ball because it's no food. It's not food. It was rejected by consumers. At that time when they introduced it, there were no laws, there were no labeling, no nothing. But it was so bad. And given freedom, given full information, my own assessment is citizens will reject technologies that abuse the planet, abuse our food, food and abuse our bodies. If they know about it. And, and if very, they know, that's why often, the right to information is yeah, so vital. And very often they don't know no. about it, they discover only later that, yeah. that these things have been done. And in a way, knowledge has become such an interesting um, place in all of this. Because on the one hand, industry is taking knowledge and turning it into their intellectual property. And on the other hand, it's saying, and this knowledge that we own goes hand in hand with not having knowledge about the risks of the product that we have monopolized. Yes. So there's no knowledge of safety and risk and the knowledge of generations of human innovation is then ours. So it's a double assault on the common knowledge. It is, isn't it? It, it really shows a deep contempt for knowledge. A, a, a deep contempt for knowledge, a deep contempt for people as knowing subjects, mm -hmm. and a deep contempt for the intelligence of nature. Yeah. Let me, let me turn you in, in, a, in a, another related direction, and that's ecofeminism. Because it seems, seems to me that if I had to summarize what I've known about your work in that field, it really is that, that uh, women have often suffered the brunt of environmental disasters much more than, than men have, and also have the capability to make contributions that they've never been asked to or in, indeed even allowed to, to make. Could you talk a little about that? You know what, the first movement I became a part of was a movement called, called Chipko. And it was women in my region of Uttarak, what is now Uttarakhand, and uh, who came out and said, you can't cut these trees because deforestation is destroying our sources of water, r robbing us of fuel and fodder, creating landslides. It's all a huge burden on us and a threat to our very survival. And they said, we will hug the trees before you can cut the trees, so you'll have to kill us before you kill the tree. It was a beautiful demonstration of the Gandhian concept of sacrifice in order to defend what must be defended. Movement was called Chipko, because Chipko means to hug. And it's the women who came out. It's the women who came out. The men could be bribed for a little bit of money to cut down the tree and a bit of alcohol. But the women, Stuck against. And I remember a particular village where the head man of the village wanted to cut the forest and the wife was there with the women saying, no, we will hug these trees, you cannot cut the forest. But if you look at, I mean, in Bhopal, we've just had a 25 year anniversary. Who is defending the rights of the children who are being maimed today? The women who were the victims of the Bhopal disaster. Poor from the slums, but haven't given up yet. And I remember around this very close to the Bhopal disaster, where you know, 3,000 funeral pyres had to be burned. Around that time, Indira Gandhi was assassinated. And the people who killed her were sentenced to death. And the women of Bhopal said, one woman dies, her killers are sentenced to death. 3,000 people have died. How come we don't have the same justice? And till today, of course, the killers of Bhopal roam free and um, try and expand their power and control over the planet. I think the reason women come out more strongly for ecological action, environmental protection, protection of the planet, is first because they do bear the worst burden. And they are the canneries in the coal mine. When the wells of Plachimada ran dry because Coca-Cola was mining 1.5 million liters a day, it's the women who had to carry the water from the wells who knew that Coca-Cola is destroying their water, and therefore started the protest. When the women of Chipko knew they had to walk further, they started the movement. They carry the burden of providing sustenance. Sustenance comes from nature. Therefore, the destruction of nature turns into a threat to their role. But they, I think there's a second deeper reason, which I'm getting more and more convinced about. 
And I think because women were left out of privilege, we were the dominated, excluded, subjugated, we weren't part of the privilege of the monoculture of the mind. We weren't part of the privilege of a mechanistic view of the world. We weren't part of the privilege of thinking that nature is dead. In our heads and in our hearts, we maintain the idea that nature is living, she's Gaia, she's our mother, that everything is connected and every action has consequence. And that's why women's knowledge becomes so vital in our time, because this is the kind of knowledge for ecological recovery. It absolutely is. But do you think that's, that's the case with Western women as well? I mean, I can, I can certainly see it in, in, uh, um, in many of the developing nations, but I, I'm not quite so sure that that would be true of the women you of know, the United I, States and Canada. I do university talks twice a year. I will go to North America. More and more young women who might never ever have had a rural background will come with my book Staying Alive and say this is what has changed my life. So I think people are understanding, the young people are understanding that something is very wrong with the way the world has been structured. And the young people are understanding that going down this way means total annihilation of our species and very violent destruction of the conditions of life on this planet. And I think it's that deep awareness that they're getting from other sources, from the analysis of the climate treaty, the data on the pollution of rivers, the disappearance of jobs as Wall Street collapses. All of this they're adding up as their knowledge. And then on their own they're making connections and saying, so what's the way out? The way out is recognizing that the same worldview that dominated nature, dominated women, and it did it for greed and power and control. And we need to leave that behind us and move into another paradigm where we see partnerships, we see cooperations, we see horizontal relationships rather than vertical dominations as the way forward. So I do feel even in the West, women who are not like the women of Chipko carrying firewood on their backs still understand ecofeminism. And, and you won't believe it. I gave an annual lecture to, in the University of Bologna. Seven-year-old boy had come with his mother. Couldn't speak English. Had read parts of my book in Italian and wanted to be introduced to me and had his mother translate it for me. He said, he said I am an eco-feminist. When seven-year-old European boys start to become eco-feminists, something is shifting. Something wonderful is happening, isn't it? Yes, and I think you're right about the younger people too. I was thinking more of, of Western women of say my age who I think in a certain sense had had their minds a bit colonized by, by the dominant culture of the time. You know? But I think the younger people, I think you're right about that. Yeah, I, I think you're resuming. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Maybe. I think you're Maybe. resuming. Maybe. Because, um, you know, I was on the streets of Seattle. We organized the Seattle protests and one of the most active groups that was with us in this movement of diverse women for diversity is something Canadian called the Raging Grannies. Of course, of course. Now, and I think grandmothers around the world are so amazingly aware of what's wrong. You know, there's a middle generation that made it big on Wall Street. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're the ones who, you know, who are part of this syndrome that was called double income, no kids families. They were the ones who were so busy that they couldn't have a kid because, you know, five days away from the law practice, mental loss of $500,000. And therefore they had women like Mary Beth become surrogate mothers. There was that generation. But I think it was just for a very short spell. And those are the ones I was thinking about. And those are the ones in many places in positions of power who are, who, they're the Margaret Thatchers, who beat men at masculinity, who beat men at domination, who beat men at saying there is no society, they're only individuals. And then she doesn't add greedy individuals at that. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. absolutely. Tell me a bit about Navdanya. Um, Navdanya means nine seeds. It also means the new gift. Um, I started to save seeds when I realized that f companies, five companies wanted to control life on this planet. The seeds that grow our food, the medicines that heal us, and the knowledge that allows all this to happen. And 
sitting in this room chilled down my spine with this sense of totalitarian power. I said, how do we respond when people have that sense of controlling everything? And I thought of Gandhi, who in the face of the British Empire, pulled out the humble spinning wheel and started to spin cloth. And said when he was asked, how do you think you can face the cannons of the empire with pieces of wood? And he said, only this can bring the empire down because it's so small that it can be in the hands of the most marginal woman in the tiniest of our huts, in the most remote of our villages. So everyone can be a freedom fighter. Everyone can be a participant in living without the empire. And I thought to myself, what would be the spinning wheel of today when an empire over life is being created? And I thought of the seed. And I'm a physicist. And in fact, I've done my PhD in the foundations of quantum theory from the University of Western Ontario. Um, I didn't know anything about plants. I walked out from my first biology lesson because they wanted us to chop up cockroaches. But as a biological Ill illiterate, I started to go to villages with books. Do you have these seeds? Do you have this plant? Started to collect seeds. Didn't have a name for this. The technical word at that time was genetic resources, which translated into any language would be atoms of the plant. Very stupid way to talk about life. And then while I was doing seed collection, I was in a tribal farmer's field in South India. And he had nine crops in his field. And I was so excited, I was collecting seeds. I said, oh my God, you've got nine crops. And he just looked at me and said, huh, Navdanya. I said, you're saying this so casually, nine seeds. What's so significant? And he gave me this discourse about how the nine planets, because we have seven planets plus the two shadow planets called Rahu and Ketu, the nine planets, the nine crops in the field, and all the nutrients that we need for a healthy diet, everything is connected. The cosmic balance, the planetary balance, and the balance of our bodies. And I immediately knew this movement had to be named Navdanya. It means bo both the nine seeds, which means the highest that you can go in diversity. After that, it becomes 10, which is one plus zero. Mm -hmm. But also the new gift the renewal of the idea of diversity in our minds, because as I've written, the monoculture of the mind is one of the biggest diseases on this planet, but not just in our minds, in our lives. And it's only when we have diversity, ordinary people have the capacity to be economic actors and to have economic in independence. What a fantastic moment to have that man I think speak we to you are, yeah. I, you know, we, we're living through fantastic times. Disastrous, yeah. but fantastic yeah. times. Yeah. But what an illustration also of, of, of the wisdom that lies with people who are, who are not acknowledged as being wise. Who, Absolutely. But, yeah. Absolutely. I know. In fact, it, Chipko is what taught me. Uh, you know, I, I was doing a PhD at that time. And um, to do a PhD in physics, you know, you have to be smart. And I was so humbled because I didn't know any of the plants the women in the villages knew. And they became my teachers. I've always said, I went to two universities in my life. The University of Western Ontario in a London that's not in England. And the Chipko University of Biodiversity. And I think we underestimate the knowledge of people. That's why I've started, you know, I run a school now called the School of the Seed. On the Navdanya farm in Dehradun, called the Beach Vidya Peet. And every year we do a course called the Grandmother's University, which is this hidden wisdom, which has to be the way forward. And Avdanya has become quite a substantial organization though, with an influ influence well beyond it's the original farm and the original idea, is that not so? I definitely think Navdanya has sort of grown and spread and like any good seed has multiplied. Um, it's not a terminator seed, it's an open pollinated seed. Um, we now have 500,000 farmers in our network who are members. Um, we work in India around 25 states, but it's not just in India. Um, the idea of Navdanya is now spreading around the world. I advise the region of Tuscany in Italy, and they've implemented Navdanya's concept. They've set up a seed bank. They've created laws of the kind that we function with in, in the common law domain. Um, because we have a school which 
gets participants from around the world, they take this idea away. I was giving a talk at a UNESCO uh, water festival two, three years ago. And these two young people came up to me and said, we're from Brazil, we were at Navdanya for a month. Now we've started a farm and a cafe because we learned from you how to link the field to the table. And these ideas are now spreading and creating not just a rejuvenation of nature, but for young people creating the recognition that jobs don't, you know, jobs are not Wall Street, becoming a doctor, becoming an engineer, or becoming a management consultant. There's work beyond all of this. And biodiversity is the place for creative work for future generations. It's a very hopeful message. And, and hope, being hopeful is not always easy in this environment. Right? Being hopeful is not easy if you don't practice hope. If you theorize hope, it's a bit like Atlas carrying the world. Because then you theorize, and theory never lets you have an experience of the open-endedness of life. You know, the brain alone, the head alone, takes you to closure. It's life interacting with life, including your living brain, having lived experiences, that generates the processes that, where window opens after window. I began very simply with saving seed. You know, to me, the idea of seed being patented was abusive. I didn't know this would take me to build the broadest organic movement in India. I didn't know that after a point, the farmers would give us a kick in our ass and say, you make us grow this wonderful stuff. We can't mix it with the contaminated thing. Now let's build a market. So we built the retail distribution with the farmers. And it grows and grows and grows to the next step, which you don't have to know when you take the first step. I think the idea of a blueprint that you have before you start walking is something that doesn't work. All you have to know is this is the right thing to do. And one step will create the opening for the next step, will create the opening for the third step. Which is why Gandhi said, you've got to be the change you want to see. You don't have to have a system in place. You don't have to have a mass line laid out for you. Everyone doing their little bit adds up to many people doing many bits. And that's what creates movements of transformation. And you know, it's interesting that what you see in one country, you also see something like it going on in another country. I mean, it's, it's interesting to me how they, for example, in, in Nova Scotia, where I come from, um, there's now a considerable movement to strengthen the farmers' markets, to go back to the original seeds, to basically localize food production, get it out of the hands of all these. And I don't think it's happening because of it's happening because it's in the air and the need is obvious right across, the, right across the, the, uh, the world. You know, when I started Navdani in 87, saying localized food system was like saying go back and live in a cave. Talking about biodiverse ecological farming, I was really treated as a heretic because I critiqued the Green Revolution. And I said it doesn't produce enough food. It's destroyed our pulses. It's destroyed our oil seeds. It's destroyed the greens that give us vitamin A and give us iron and has therefore led to the prevalence of blindness and anemia in women and children. Today, as you so uh, rightly said, you can go anywhere in the world and people are creating new possibilities and so much of it is around food. Mm -hmm. And some of it is around the realization of the end of oil, which you just touched on at the very yeah. beginning here. But but the recognition that when the oil price hits 140, which it's done, and then hits 240 and 340 and 440, yeah. that, the point, that you cannot bring, be bringing your food from halfway around the world. You've it, got to find it someplace exactly. close at hand. And I think the other shift that is taking place, and I think that's with, you know, that one closure is oil and peak oil, but the other co closure is jobs. That as this crazy financial economy that destroyed the real economy and local economies and made people believe it's all about money floating around the world, fictitious money, seven times, 70 times more than the real wealth in the world, that that would carry on growing and growing and growing, that the bubbles keep growing. They, they didn't realize bubbles burst. At a certain point, bubbles burst. Most people who had common sense knew this bubble would burst. Wall Street only learned it in September of 2008. Young people are seeing this happen. And so they know you have to create 
other kinds of jobs and other kinds of livelihoods. You have an end of oil and you have an end of the work that the industrial civilization and the global financial economy promised you. And out of that come the new openings that people are making. It's true, isn't it? And they, as they go out and invent jobs that didn't exist before. They're inventing they, totally, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it's limitless. Yeah. The po yes. potential is limitless. Part of what that monoculture of the mind has meant, and it's, a, it's a wonderful phrase and, it's a, and it's a very, it points to a very, you know, a very important phenomenon, but it's also meant a stunting of the imagination. You know? Very serious stunting of the imagination. And mm -hmm. you know, the monocultures of the mind really got sort of reinforced as a way of describing what's happening. First through my work on forestry in Chipko, because constantly the foresters would say, but there's no, there's no forest here because it was oak and rhododendron that the women used and they wanted the pine. Or in South India, rich rainforests with diversity of species in the mega centers of biodiversity. They'd say, no, there's no timber here because they didn't see a eucalyptus. And I realized that a monoculture of the mind can make you blind to what exists. You don't see it. And then when I started to work on the Green Revolution, the rich biodiverse mixed systems, they say there's no food out here. It's only when you grow chemical food, suddenly food appears. And so it creates a huge blindness to the potential of people. They're now saying people aren't skilled. It, they're not, you know, I mean, all with the economic crisis, older people who are losing their jobs, they're calling them unskilled rather than realizing how many skills they have that society should tap. Or how many skills a farmer has that the future needs. And you know we don't we don't uh, we're only see, it seems we're only beginning to learn how to measure some of those things because part of the problem has been a problem of measurement, isn't it? That, that, for example, the forest exists only as potential lumber, if and the forest in itself has no value. We're only now beginning to sort of count up and say, wait a minute, it had a big big value and and we've lost that when we cut it down. I think you know that's where the the mechanical revolution, which is called the scientific revolution, really laid the foundation of a way of thinking that reduced the world into what was commercially exploitable. And whatever was not commercially exploitable did not exist and therefore could be destroyed. Because if you've already declared that the earth is empty, it's terra nullius, then to kill a few indigenous people and destroy a few bison and kill the fish, you know, you're not killing them because they weren't there. And it's, it's like an anesthesia. You give yourself an anesthesia to say, it's not, I'm not really doing any harm because it's all dead anyway. Um, I've just done a new manifesto for a commission that I chair. It's called the International Commission on the Future of Food. And this latest manifesto is on the knowledge paradigm. And we had the top scientists of the world sitting around together. We had the top people from the food movement top policy makers and we just first talked and said you know where are things getting stuck so people working on genetic engineering said we're getting stuck because we think of the world as just atoms of the genes but every gene is related to 100 other genes there's no isolated gene and we're building an entire infrastructure on the idea of an in I isolated gene we are building entire social projects on the idea of an in isolated individual so this mechanistic paradigm, I think, has lived its times. And we now need holistic knowledge that allows us to perceive interconnections. That's the teaching we have to do for the future generations. The ability to see, and interconnections are not measurable. Interconnections are knowable through experience. The women of Chipko knew the deep interconnection between the forest and the river. It took a flood in 1978 to have the government to wake up to this connection. Before that, timber was timber, broad feet to be sold in the marketplace. It's this interconnection, knowledge of interconnections, knowledge of the way the web of life functions, knowledge of the way societies that create happiness function. Happiness is created out of relationship, isolation is a ready-made condition for unhappiness. 
So is it possible, the thought, thought that I've been turning around, is, is it possible that we are coming to the end of about a 300-year romance with reductionism, which has delivered us some amazing things, but has finally turned out to be a dead end? Um, I think we're coming to an end of 500 years of colon colonization of yes. all kinds, yeah. which then led to 300 years of reductionism, which was the colonization of the mind. And I think it's definitely ru running out in its steam. And I experience that in terms of the way in debates. When, you know, the other side is not losing, they give you facts, they turn out studies, they have a respectful debate. When they start telling you that you are responsible for the one billion hungry people and the 50 million children who are blind, I know they have a sense, their game is over. <laughs> yes, those are desperate, uh, desperate expressions, aren't they? Um, Earth Democracy, one of your most recent books, seems to me to be t taking the positive, um, the positive side of all of this forward in a very strong and, and interconnected kind of way. How do you feel about the progress of the movement, the, what, what, for want of a better term, we might call the Earth Democracy movement? Um, you know, the Copenhagen summit is predetermined to be a failure. In the sense, the governments who should be meeting their commitments according to the United Nations Convention on climate change and the Kyoto Protocol that came out of it are backtracking and saying, no, we won't. We'll just make nice political declarations. We won't mean anything about what we say while the world is warming the ice is melting, we've just flown past Mount Everest, which was black, not white. I've done a whole year of studies on the crisis of climate change in the Himalaya, and it's a serious, serious crisis. The source of the Ganga, the Ganga tree, is retreating at 23 meters a year. We're talking about a civilizational wipeout if we do not start taking action. The governments have said we won't take action, and yet there's a flowering of initiatives around the world saying we'll do organic farming because we know that's 40% of the climate solution. We will redesign our cities and make place for the bicycle. We will change our paradigm of mobility. We will redesign our homes in ways that are not so dependent on fossil fuel. And all of this is coming from people, not from government design. And I really see hope only in Earth democracy of democracy growing from the grassroots up, solutions to really big problems like climate change growing right from the grassroots up. And I don't mean by that that government should therefore be left absolutely free. But it's only when people are able to practice what they believe in and are then able to tell the governments, and this practice must now be turned into policy, and your job is to frame policy, that we will get the action that will not be committed to in Copenhagen. So this is the time for Earth democracy because representative democ democracy is failing us in a very serious way. Yes, it is, and the, the, the in a way, the, the issue as to how, how, you reach, how you reach from Earth democracy to the representative democracy that's actually making those decisions at places like uh, Copenhagen. Um, I think part of, the ch part of the challenge of Earth democracy is to distribute power again. Just as much as we know that if we have to have a future in food security, then we can't have seeds only in Monsanto's hands. Seed must be distributed on a very large scale. Democracy needs to be de distributed on a very, very large scale. And democracy is not just about putting the vote once in four years or five years and letting someone represent you who stops representing you. Because part of the crisis of our times is corporations have got so much power. They've become global actors. And they now treat our governments as their little serfs to implement their orders, not the instructions of the people who brought them to power. So democracy has mutated from of the people, by the people, for the people, into of the corporations, for the corporations, by the corporations. To save representation, we need to show our governments that people have power. 
and we are the countervailing power to corporate power. And I'm feel, I feel very confident about this, you know. Uh, ten women of Plachimada shut down a Coca-Cola plant. Again and again and again, we've you know, beaten Monsanto in its projects. Enron, which said it would be the biggest corporation on earth. And we had Rebecca Mark, the head, ride into a board meeting on an elephant to show she was the new Maharani. Enron went bust. Yeah? Um, so I, I think we need governments to see that the corporations are not all there is. We need to remind them about citizenship. And active citizenship to me is earth democracy. Absolutely, and, and but finding the mechanism by which you force them to deliver. What's striking to me is how often governments deliver what you know from you know, public opinion polls and so forth. They deliver precisely what the people do not want and get away with it. You know? That's, the, that, that's the, one of the sticking points I'd love yeah. to see us find a way to get past soon. I, and I think that happens very often because they do a divide and rule. So for instance, uh, people marched around the world to say, we don't want a war in Iraq. We don't want a war in Afghanistan. And the governments went ahead because they could divide the people who were marching from those who were not marching and saying, those people are putting your security under threat. Um, I am constantly having to intervene in food debates. The food prices are rising. The government turn around and say, oh, it's because the farmers are charging too much. We have to show that the farmers are in fact earning less and less and less, while what people eat is costing more and more and more, and it's the corporations walking away with super profits around the world, in Canada, in Bhutan, in India, everywhere. Um, that next step of giving that push, I think, rests on two things. And for this, I really depend on Gandhi. I think the first thing is the recognition that we are sovereign, each of us. Sovereignty is not located in a centralized state. It's in each of us. And exercising that sovereignty is a duty as a citizen. For that, in terms of economic colonization, we need to be sure that we start participating in making things. I think part of the reason for this global colonization is we've been told that human beings are just consumers. All you have to do, you know, stop doing the work, stop working on your farm, chuck it all, just wait for the next Nike shoe. Yeah? And as long as we believe we are only consumers, we will be enslaved. It's when we start saying, but these hands were meant to create, this brain was supposed to work, these legs were supposed to walk. We suddenly realize we have potential to do much more than we are being allowed to do. Reclaiming our role as makers and creators is a very big part of shifting the ground. That's what Gandhi did with the Khadi. That's what we've done with food. He said, we won't depend on GM food. We'll make our own food, grow our own seeds, and we will Connect it with the third lesson. No society has been able to change policy or governance in periods of dictatorship by sitting back and being dictated to. Racism would not have ended in America if Martin Luther King would not have taken Rosa Parks' lesson of civil disobedience to the next step. Colonialism would not have happened ended in India, if Gandhi had not walked to Champaran and said, we will not grow indigo because it's leading to starvation. And when they made a monopoly of the salt laws, he walked to the beach in Gujarat, lifted the salt from the sea, and said, nature gives it for free, we will make it for our survival. Therefore, we will not obey your laws. Now the interesting thing is, in all of this climate stuff, People think America is the biggest player because it's manipulating China, it's manipulating India. You know who the biggest players are? The African countries. Because during the Barcelona negotiations in the lead up to Copenhagen, they had the courage to say, you are manipulating these negotiations. We will not participate in your manipulation. And they walked out. This power to say no, to abuse, to brutal law, to unjust law, is what Gandhi called Satyagraha, the power of truth. Ultimately, that's 
our strength. Education seems to be one of those areas where we have, we've really been trained to be passive, we've been trained to be passive consumers, we've been trained to be passive voters, we've been trained to think that we didn't have any part of the, uh, in the politics of our own lives between elections and not much even then. We're going to have to have a different kind of education. What, what, how do you see that unfolding? Um, I don't think we can overnight shut down our schools and universities. What we will have to do is, in a complementary and supplementary way, create centers of learning. Uh, I've tried to do that with our School of the Seat, the Beach with the Apeet, the Schumacher College. These are places where learning centers are emerging, where you can replenish yourself for the education for living on this planet, the education for living in community, the education for skills of survival doing the things that everyone should know how to do, rather than being cripples. And these learning centers are all ecologically oriented. So all our courses, for example, at Beach with Pete, are about sustainability. And overall, we call our school Education for Earth Citizenship. Um, I think this new education that is emerging, it's not just theory. And I think just like the food movement just grew everywhere, I'm confident in the next few years we will see this new education movement grow. In certain places it will be able to impact formal institutions. Certain places it will just keep growing on its own terms. The three ingredients of it will be deep ecological understanding of our relationships with the planet and the planet's relationships with all its constituent parts. The second, the shift from consumerism to creators and co-producers with nature. And the third, active civic participation and shaping of everyday democracy. What a wonderful world could come out of that. I think it will. Thank you very much. This has been just a wonderful conversation. I'm deeply grateful to have had it with you. Thank you. The Green Interview is co-produced and directed by Chris Beckett with the generous cooperation of Mount St. Vincent University in Halifax, Nova Scotia. For The Green Interview, I'm Silver Donald Cameron. See you next time. <laughs>